In 1977, the American modernist designers Charles and Ray Eames made a short film about the relative size of things in the universe. The filmmakers took viewers on a journey to the edges of the known universe, first into the furthermost reaches of outer space, then into inner space, the nucleus of a carbon atom inside a strand of DNA. The Eames explained to viewers the marvels of astronomy and biology at a time when knowledge about both was exploding. Since the Powers of Ten was made, the power of computing has advanced by many orders of magnitude in tandem with the expansion of knowledge about the workings of the universe. Data processing that required a mainframe computer a few decades ago can now be performed on a mobile phone. Geneticists can now undertake research into everything from the design of an individual person's genome to the historic migrations of humans across the globe. What could only be guessed at in the past can now be known with increasing certainty. For the first time in our 200,000 year history, we humans are truly coming to know ourselves. The last 15 or 20 years has seen a tremendous change at the intersection of technology and biology. Uh, we used to be at a, at a stage in uh, research where just knowing the sequence of a simple single piece of DNA was enormously difficult. Today, reading the genome of an organism, whether it is something as complex as a human or something as small and, and uh, simple as a virus, uh, these are things that we do fairly routinely now. Whenever we talk about genome, we are always reading little fragments at a time, and we are reading billions of them. Smartness has to come in, and the smartness comes through algorithms. Archaeologists and paleontologists have made great strides in tracing the paths of ancient human migrations. Now, our understanding of what happened to our species, when, and why, is expanding rapidly. The Genographic Project, undertaken by the National Geographic Society and IBM, has collected genetic data from nearly 400,000 people worldwide. The research has confirmed that the species began in the Rift Valley in eastern Africa and that people began to migrate out of Africa about 50,000 years ago. The human written record only goes back about 5,000 years or so at most, and obviously people were living where they were living at that point already. Uh, to find out how they got there to all these places, how we migrated around the world as a species prior to that 5,000 year period, we've historically had to go out and dig things up out of the ground. But of course we're all carrying a written document inside of ourselves, in our DNA, which we got from our parents and they got from their parents. It tracks an unbroken lineage back in time and allows us to see back to the very earliest days of our species. We're an incredibly diverse species. We look around the world, we see people who seem to be so different from each other, from ourselves, all different skin colors and hair types, eye colors. But when you peel away those surface layers, you look beneath, you look into the DNA, into the genome, you find that people are nearly identical, 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level. So despite all this surface diversity, we're actually very closely related to each other. One of the most intriguing elements of the Genographic Project is a study of the ancient Phoenicians. Their culture, which thrived beginning more than 4,000 years ago, was centered in the Levant, a narrow strip of land in what is now modern-day Lebanon, Syria, and northern Israel. To support their trading activities, they established a network of ports and colonized around the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. They became a cultural intermediary for the region, spreading knowledge that helped spark the flowering of Greek culture. Eventually, the Phoenicians disappeared. In modern times, some researchers question their historical significance and who they were and where they came from. Well, the Phoenicians are very interesting to genetics research because they did, they did not write or what they wrote disappeared. So the idea was, can we find something about them in their genes? So that was the quest that we were after. Can we prove that people who were Phoenicians 3,000 years ago still live in that place? If they left a genetic footprint in any of the colonies that they established, we should be able to pick up those traces and compare to places that are not far apart, that were not colonized by the Phoenicians. So there'll be a common denominator all across these colonies that we could trace back to the source. Think of the genetic code as something like a lineup of vehicles in a parking lot, all different kinds. In their research, Zalua and his colleagues found three vehicles that were common just to the parking lots of the Levant and the former colonies. The vehicle and parking lot metaphor makes this sound easier than it really is. Researchers face a major challenge. 
One of the biggest problems that we are facing has to do with handling huge and massive amounts of data. It's going to be here very soon. We have to have ways of solving those problems and understanding how to get real signal out of this highly correlated data. Another of the remarkable results of Zalua and his team's work was their discovery that the modern Christians and Muslims in Lebanon share a common genetic blueprint. Some of the Crusaders who came from Europe stayed behind and intermarried with the local population. In fact, the Genographic Project shows that the same is true of people everywhere. We all have a common genetic heritage. At the very end, the interesting lesson of genetics is that the classical classification of rates doesn't make any sense. And instead of that, what we do have is a history of populations, a history of humankind in which we can recognize the demographic events of expansion, the events related to migrations, the events related to admixture between populations, and this is what we can reconstruct thanks to our genes. Researchers are at last able to map the entire genomes of individuals, and theoretically at least, the entire population of the world. But the actual gathering of data and mapping and exposing of patterns remains a huge and expensive task. The cost has to come down dramatically if we are to get the full benefit of the gene revolution. Genomics has been growing exponentially since the dawn in the 1970s, um, improving by 50%, 1.5 fold per year. Over the last six years, that increased to factors of 10 per year. And this is already making it into the clinics. Real patients are getting their cancers or their digestive uh, diseases um, analyzed, and the, and the diagnosis can flip quite radically. Scientists at IBM Research have invented a breakthrough technology that could help deliver on these promises. Today, it's difficult to accurately and quickly read the millions of tiny bead-like nucleotide bases in a molecule of DNA. But researchers Gustavo Stolovitsky and Stanislaw Polanski came up with a simple yet effective method for sequencing genes called the DNA transistor. The researchers position a thin membrane of silicon in a reservoir of fluid. They place strands of genetic material in one side of the reservoir. The membrane is dotted with many tiny holes called nanopores. They apply electrical charges which draw the strands through the holes. The strands can be quickly read and recorded one element at a time. So we are working towards that idea. I think the idea is, is wonderful and we, so far the laws of physics have not uh, been uh, screaming against us. They are uh, engineering problems, but it seems, you know, the, the kind of problems that can be solved with enough work. So how low can we go in price? Really, there are all kinds of applications where computing and sample prep aren't limiting and the price could keep going below uh, where it is now. And the, interestingly, the demand seems to be keeping up quite well too. If you were to lower the price of some things by a million fold, for example, if I were to give you a million times as much food on the table, it's sort of like you sit down and you eat a million times more food and you say, I'd like a lot more, please. And that's, where we, that's the reaction that we've seen to the, to the last six factors of 10. Science has come a long way since the Eames made powers of 10 in 1977. In the past, most accounts of human history focused on leaders, power struggles, and wars. Now, we're able to understand the role in history of the great mass of ordinary humans. At the same time, as genetics make individuals ever more comprehensible, that new level of understanding promises to deliver powerful new weapons in our battles against diseases. That's really what technology has done for us. It's, it's opened the aperture of what you can observe. And so now it's inviting us to comprehend more and more of the universe that surrounds us. I'm talking about the, the genomic universe, for example. It's inviting us to comprehend more and more of it. And so this, we are in fantastic times, therefore. You know, I, can, I can see a lot more occurring in the next few years. Thank you.